All right, y'all, I'm so excited because I get to hang out with my real life great friend and brilliant Bible teacher, Christy McClellan. Christy, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I feel like we should be doing this over sushi. I know, I was just gonna say, <laughs> wild ginger. Like, that's where we normally <laughs> hang out, and so that's where all of our conversations are. This is fun, because even though it's a set and it's office and all that, I'm just so excited because every time I get to have a conversation with you, it feels like we've been friends forever, even though we've just been hanging out recently. Mm -hmm. But it's also one of those things where it always centers on God's Word. But I'm just so grateful for your friendship. And I know for anybody that's watching that doesn't know who you are, tell us a little bit about your story and what brought you to Nashville and what you do. Well, originally I'm from rural Mississippi, um, so I know how to drive a tractor barefoot (laughs) if you ever need that skill set. Uh, But accepted Christ when I was nine years old. And one of the changes um, that my parents actually recognized in me early on was just this insane curiosity for the Bible. And that has just traveled with me the entire time that I've known the Lord and been walking with Him. And when I was 16 years old, I was walking down the hallway at my church and my youth pastor stopped me. And he said, Christy, I want to ask you a question. And I said, okay. And I don't know if he was asking all of the kids this or if it was just a divine moment. But he looked at me and he said, what is it that you would do all day, every day, for the rest of your life for free? Just a small question for a 16-year-old. Just a tiny little question. No 16-year-old is trying to figure that out. (laughs) And, you know, I'm just trying to figure out who am I hanging out with Friday night. Sure, sure. But I heard myself say I would teach people the Word of God. Wow. And that moment is such a gift for me Mm -hmm. because I was a young girl in a world where girls could not teach Bible Mm -hmm. and were not supposed to teach Bible. And so how do you burn for something you can't have and that you can't do? That seems impossible. Right. Um, And so, you know, Did it feel weird to say, real quick, did it feel weird to say that out loud, to hear yourself say that? To hear me, well, it was a moment of calling. It was almost like the Lord used my own voice to show me my calling and my purpose, the plumb line of my life and that right. somehow in some way I would as a female touch the scriptures know the scriptures be able to teach the scriptures sit in the scriptures with people um, long before I ever was actually able to to walk into those things in those spaces so 16 was a big year for me and went on to college my undergrads in biology because again girls can't teach bible mm. so I'll go be a physical therapist sure. and God was like nice try <laughs> yeah I mean way to go Um, And then just throughout the years, for the past 15 years, I've been teaching Bible at Williamson College here in town. In 2007, the Lord opened up the door for me to go study the Bible in Egypt and Israel. And I tell people all the time, I went to Israel and learned that God is better than I ever knew. Mm -hmm. And I came home just wrecked, Christy. I mean, wonderfully, if you can be wrecked in the best kind of a way, the living God met me in that incarnational space where he just took on— flesh and came down. And it it's still changing me 13 years later. So for the past 13 years, I really feel like my function, my calling, people call me a professor, they call me a Bible teacher, but I am a bridge yeah. between the Western church and the worlds and the lands of the Bible. Yeah. And so for the past 13 years, I've been serving as a biblical culturalist, mm. and I teach the Bible through its original historical, cultural, linguistic, and geographic context. I've been taking teams to Israel for the last 13 years. I'm a visual learner. I need to see it, touch it, taste it, eat it. And um, it feels great. I'm 46 years old, and I feel so absolutely centered Mm. that I am doing and being, living and breathing exactly what the living God wants me to do. Mm. And there's such a shalom in that. It's it's more than peace. There's such a shalom. I love the the stories that you've told me, even just when we've had sushi and hung out. And I remember you telling me about this trip in 2007 because you went to seminary. You have the the education, the experience, mm-hmm. the knowledge of Scripture. But the way that you talk about that trip in 2007 and how God is better than you ever knew. And you even did, like, when we were at sushi, you did, you're like, I'm a bridge. And you did, like, a visual <laughs> of the bridge. So I was like, got it, you're a bridge. But it's like, I love how visual you teach. But what's so cool about it is— you have a way of not just understanding that for yourself, if God is better than you ever knew, you have a way of transferring that to people. And you have to me and mentoring me. Mm-hmm. I know you do through all of the women that you teach and through your Bible studies and your and your preaching and teaching. So I want to I want to kind of camp on this idea for a second, mm-hmm. because as I've been trying to walk through this in my own life and help women understand, okay, if we're so often we feel like we do lose ourselves. A lot of mm-hmm. women, and I, I would say myself included, you might have moments of it or days of it, but I don't it, it's very difficult to to feel secure like you just described mm-hmm. and like I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing and this feels so centered and and at peace. And so I love 
as I walk this out in my own life, helping women Mm -hmm. get back to themselves. That's what I hear them say all the time, Christy. They're like, I just want to get back to me. Mm -hmm. I just want to get back to Mm -hmm. me. And there's practical ways of that, tactical ways of that. There's also like a, there's a a spiritual aspect of that. And where I always want to take them to start for them, that the people that I help and also myself is, you can't know who you are if you don't first know who God is. You don't know the one that created you. If you want to get back to you, Mm -hmm. then you need to know the one that created you to begin with. So I want to, I want to camp on this idea of who God is and what he tells us about himself and his word, what he tells us about um, the, the different attributes of him. And one of the things that you have taught me as going back to the cultural lens mm-hmm. is we as a Western culture read the Bible so differently mm-hmm. than, than how it was originally written. We're re- you even talked about like the part of our brain when we read left to right, how we're picking apart and it was written to be put together as a story. So talk to us a little bit about scripture and the love story of the Bible and what God wants us to know about himself. Maybe some things we know and maybe some things we are missing or, or misunderstanding. I'm about to come off the couch. Yes, I'm, I'm so like, excited to talk about this. So I tell people all the time, the Bible was given to us that we might know who God is, what he's like, and what it is to walk with him. Mm. And when I talk about that God is better than I ever knew and that that was something that just, that I learned again and anew in Israel, it's the idea of here in the West, as a Western culture, we are infinitely more Rome and Athens than we are Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. We are more Greco-Roman. I was gonna say unpack that, explain what that means. Yes, so we're more Greco-Roman as a culture. And so we're more Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato than we are Jesus, Peter, Paul as a people. And so when we read the Bible, sometimes we read it and we lead out with the question, what does this teach me about me? We wanna go right to application. What am I supposed to do with this? But in the Middle East, they ask a different question. They don't ask, what does this teach me about me? they lead out with, what does this teach me about God? Mm. And I tell people all the time, how many of you know if you stare at yourself too long, you'll get depressed? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) you know, but when we read the Bible and we begin with God, who are you? What is this showing me about who you are and what you're like? Staring at ourselves may take us one direction, but staring at the living God it brings transformation. Mm. It provokes us unto all righteousness. It quickens us. It centers us. It aligns us. And so I tell my students all the time, we never actually just read the Bible. We interact with it. It is living and active, and so are we. And so the rabbis of Israel talk about when any human being sits down with the scriptures, it is life with life, which produces lahaim, like the good life, the marrow of life. Wow. And so there's this invitation in the very fact that God gave us a Bible. It's one of the ways that he is showing himself, that he's revealing himself. And so when we open it up, this idea that you were talking about, sometimes women, lo- we lose ourselves. Mm-hmm. What's going on? All of a sudden, I'm blinking and it's Thursday. I thought it was Monday. Yeah. You know, life I'm running comes errands. so quickly. I, yeah. You know, am I on top of everything? Right. You know, am I dropping balls? All of this. For me, when I sit down with the scriptures, I really think the first step is always to pray. Mm-hmm. And it's to posture ourselves to receive what it is that the living God has for us. Yeah. Because too often, even for us who are reading our Bibles, it becomes a thing to do. I need to have my morning quiet time yeah. so that I can check it rather than really viewing it like the living God of the universe is getting ready to meet with me yeah. in this moment. Yeah. And He is here and I am here and I am reading what He has written about who He is and it sets me on fire. Mm. It, it's a it, completely different posture. You approach it with the way that you describe that yes. because I think so often we do approach even our quiet time, our scripture, looking at it from the lens of what does this say about me? What am I supposed to do? Mm-hmm. You're more of a consumer. I love one of your your favorite one of my favorite lines of something you say is the way that was intentionally written was you stare at God and glance at yourself. We stare at ourselves and glance at God. It's like it's supposed to be flipped and it changes everything mm-hmm. about how you read the word, but even how it transforms you when you're fixated on him and realize it's a story about him, not about us. So I love I love that idea. As you're as you teach this and as you're helping people understand the cultural context and how to read it, what do you think are the attributes or qualities or aspects of God 
that we misunderstand or we, it's like, we're just so busy. We're like, okay, he loves us. He's, you know, we kind of check these boxes. Like you said, Mm -hmm. what are some things that's like for us to sit in? He's the, I love how you, I noticed this about you, Christy. You almost never that I can think of refer to God as just God. It's always the living God, Mm -hmm. the living God. It's like, you're reminding people he's the living God. You're meeting with the living God. Mm -hmm. What are some other aspects or words that you put to go, you know what? We've got to remember this if we're going to know who he is. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind when you ask that, and it's a little bit back to the differentiations of West and Middle East, but we have a famous story in the Bible. I don't care what denomination you grew up in. If you didn't even grow up in church, you've at least heard of this story. And here we call it the parable of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. It's found in Luke 15 in the Gospels. And what's so interesting is in the Middle East, they do not call it that. It is called something different. And I remember studying in Israel and a rabbi beginning to unpack this. And he goes, today we're going to talk about the parable of the running father. And I thought, I've never read the parable of the running father. Where is that in the Bible? New story. Who knew? And it's Luke 15. And so now we're back to when we read the Bible and ask, what does it teach me about me? We find our, we locate ourselves in that story as the prodigal son, the older son, whichever one. But in the Middle East, no, who is God? He's the running father. Wow. He's the father who runs for his son Mm -hmm. who's gone to the far country, who is lost. And when you go read that story, uh, (laughs) I mean, I could start crying, but the Bible is adamant that God is doing the work and he's going to finish the work, that there is a deep and profound restoration and renewal of Mm -hmm. all things. Mm -hmm. That every day, even when you and I are asleep at night, when the Bible talks about God does not sleep, the living God does not slumber, he is working like yeast into dough. Mm -hmm. This profound, like turning things right side up. He's not afraid to be in a fallen world. And so when you ask me, what are those attributes? And when I think about the living God, you know, one of my self-care rhythms is I'm a morning person. If I'm not up before the sun comes up, my whole day is gone. I like to wake up and it's dark outside. And my little dog, Chester, we get our coffee and we go out (laughs) on a walk. And, you know, every morning of my life when I'm walking in the dark, just me, the living God, and my dog, I'm like, Lord, you are the running father for me today. Because so often it's like, man, if I'm feeling disheveled or if I'm out there, how do I get home? And I think that the Bible is telling a very different story. It's when we realize that we're lost, He's the running Father who is coming for us to bring us home. Mm. And that's a very different story. You know, um, when you think about sheep in the Middle East, during my study time there, we followed a shepherd with his sheep all day, just observing, because it's the greatest metaphor in the Bible for God and us. And something that was just so beautiful and and wrecking of my heart was when a sheep recognizes that it is separated from the fold and lost, it does not start trying to figure out how to get back. It hunkers down and it starts crying out. Wow. Hunkers down and starts crying out to be found. Mm. And it's the good shepherd who searches for the lost sheep until he finds it. This is Luke 15. And when he finds it, will he not put it on his shoulders and carry it home? The hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that the living God is running for us and he is relentless in the run and he will run until he finds us and he will put us on his shoulders and he will bring us home. Mm -hmm. And that is the story of the Bible. That is the hopefulness that we have in Jesus. Jesus. We are a people being found and carried home. Mm. We don't have to figure it all out. Mm. That Even that right there is not only so countercultural, it's almost like it's that feeling that th- the emotion that rises up with me, even as you describe that visual, is like, oh, it feels too good to be true. You know what I mean? It's like, it's almost like it's, it's like the grace, like when it really sinks in your spirit, you're going, oh, Lord, that just feels like too much for me to even handle. And I think what's so beautiful about this reminder that you're talking about is we're such a culture of doing. Like, okay, I just need to have better goals. Mm -hmm. I need to have a more efficient to-do list. Mm -hmm. I need a new app. Is there an app for the running God of the running fathers? Or like an app? Like we're such doers. And and I'm certainly one of those women that's like a a go-getter, an achiever, type A. 
But when you realize that when you come to the end of yourself, because you will, because I will, oh, yeah. because we all do, um, and 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 we want to get back to ourselves that it's not about doing, mm-hmm. that He will come for us. I love how you said He is a God that does the work. Because mm-hmm. gosh, Christy, we feel like, well, if I've lost myself, I need to do more to get back to myself. I need to achieve more or be more efficient or ha- manage my calendar better. And I just love how you're flipping not only the story of the prodigal son on its head, of this is not the story about the son and what he did or didn't do. It's about the story of the father. He's the subject of the sentence. He's the yes. hero of the story that he he runs. It's his action that the story is about. That as a story of our life. That as a story of women that are feeling lost, mm-hmm. um, not just maybe even separated from God in some way or, or their faith, but women that are going like, I'm exhausted. Mm-hmm. My life isn't like I thought. My dreams um, didn't come fulfilled. Oh. I've been disappointed. What can I do more to get back to who I am or, or what I'm about? And I love this reminder that you're going, oh, no, he's a God that does the work. The the, the sheep. Oh, that got me, Christy. Yeah. Like the visual, the sheep hunkering down mm-hmm. and, crying and crying out. out. If you want to get back to you, if you want to get mm-hmm. back to who God created you to be, hunker down and cry out. And God is that Father Mm -hmm. that will run to you. And He will. I mean, my prayers have changed the last 13 years uh, because I'm an only child. I'm a two on the Enneagram, (laughs) and I'm OCD, which I think is a spiritual gift, but it's not in the Bible. Um, And so I I can get really sideways when I feel out of control. Mm -hmm. Because being an only child, my toys were exactly where I left them. Like Uh, Everything should be exactly as I left it. Right. And, you know, I used to pray a lot, you know, God, help me figure this out. You know, help me. What am I supposed to do? In the last 13 years since studying Inezhal, I'm like, you know what, Lord? Come find me. Just come find me. Yeah. And wisdom finds us. Wow. You know, there's a phrase in the Old Testament that we see over and over, and it goes like this, and the word of the Lord came upon, and the word of the Lord came to, mm. and the word of the Lord came upon, and the word of the Lord came to. We don't have to open up our Bibles and dig something out to feed ourselves. The word is living. It is active. Breath of God, spirit of God, person of the living God coming for us. Mm. And so I really do think that there's something to posturing ourselves like daughters. We are not orphans. We are not the fatherless. Yeah. We are not here alone. He really is with us, and He's taking us somewhere, and He is going to see it through to the yeah. end. How would you encourage someone that they might understand some of that intellectually? They, mm-hmm. Let's say they grew up in the church. They know that God is good. They know that God loves them. They know that God is for them. All, all the things that we know <clears throat> that the, the Word tells us about God, about Himself, but their situation is anything but that. Mm-hmm. And they want to know that God is runs for them, but they don't feel God's mm-hmm. present, presence. They they want to know that God is good, but their situation doesn't feel good. Mm-hmm. And they're in that place of going, okay, God, I know you say this. I know this is the truth in your word, but my situation is this, and it feels so different than what you say. How do you encourage women to reset, refocus, mm-hmm. recenter on the truth of his word when their situation is anything but that? And we have so many examples in scripture of yeah. of that and yeah. the disciples going through that. But for some reason, when it's us, it's way harder mm-hmm. than understanding someone else going through a hard time when we're going through that. Mm-hmm. And, and the situation is so hard, we just want to find an emergency exit. We just want God to fix it. We want it to be over with. And sometimes we're sitting in this hard time and and it's really hard to remember that God is good. Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you encourage people in that place? You know, and the first thing that comes to my mind is when I read the Bible, God does some of His best work in the desert. Mm. I've heard you talk about this. We're talking about that. Talk about that. I love it when you teach on this. In the wilderness, you know, when you think about the book of Exodus, Exodus is all about deliverance. The Israelites have been slaves in Egypt. And what's so interesting is in one night, God miraculously delivers the Israelites from Egypt. He parts the Red Sea. I love that the Bible says the living God vigilantly watched over them all night as they passed through the sea, like a father just hovering, watching, and waiting. So in one night, he delivers the Israelite out of Egypt, but it would take 40 years in the desert to get Egypt out of the Israelite. Wow. And so when we think about the 40 years of the wilderness wanderings, the the desert wanderings, we have this idea given by the living God of a tabernacle. 
God doesn't say, you know what, guys, you're going to be in the desert. You're going to be in the wilderness for 40 years, and I'm going to be transcendent and up here and out here, and I hope it all works out right. for you. Canaan is that way. Right, right, right. You know, I'll give you a map. He says, no, build me a tabernacle. Build me a dwelling. Build me a tent. I want to live with and among you. And so back to who is God. He is the one in our wilderness seasons who tabernacles with us. He is here with and among us. And, you know, back to some differentiations between West and Middle East. Typically, when we speak of a wilderness, if I'm like, Chrissy, how are you doing, girl? And you're like, I am in a wilderness. Yeah, yeah. You there, mean, yeah. I just want to get out. Yeah. You know, when we find ourselves in wilderness seasons, it's what got me here. What did I do wrong? How long, oh Lord? What is and my how action do I get plan? out? <laughs> yeah. yeah, where's the exit? What do I need to do yeah. to get out? Yeah. And the Hebrew people, the Israelite people, they view the wilderness so differently because it's actually the place where you go to get your word from the Lord. Mm. The word word in Hebrew is devar. And the word for wilderness is midbar. So there's a phrase that the rabbis use of when you wake up in a wilderness, and we all have, I mean, 2020, can we get a <laughs> refund on 2020? Great. I don't know where to fill yeah. out that paperwork <laughs> yeah. or where to submit yeah. that. But I mean, the world has been in something of a wilderness this 2020 year with COVID and everything else going on. But for the Israelites, oh, we're in a wilderness. They ask a different question. It's not, what did I do to get here? Where's the exit? How long, oh Lord? How do I get out? They ask the question, okay, Lord, what is my devar in the midbar? What is my word wow. in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. And it's almost back to that sheep with the hunkering down and crying out. They really view the wilderness as a place where God meets his people, where he gives his word, yeah. um, which ends up being wisdom and instruction right. and strategy yeah, yeah. and comfort yeah, yeah. and goals right. and, you know, all of that. And so it's just a place of, of union mm -hmm. and communion yeah. with the living God. And yeah. so, you know, just back to my last 13 years, you know, this year has been hard for me in all honesty. I am homesick. I miss home, and by home, I mean Jerusalem. Yeah. I feel more like myself when I'm in in Israel than I ever do here. Yeah. But, you know, I'm still trying to, like, figure out church clothes yeah. and make makeup. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just in a brand new world. New things are coming for me, new opportunities. I'm scared. I'm intimidated. I'm insecure. I'm like, oh, my gosh, Lord, what is going on? I just want to go to Jerusalem and eat a falafel yeah. on a corner somewhere. <laughs> I know that world. I yeah. know that world. You know, can I please just get get back to life as I know it? And, you know, five Israel trips this year— none of them are going to make. And so it's been a lot of loss. Mm -hmm. And it's been really disorienting for the only child, OCD, mm -hmm. who really likes to live with my ducks in a row. Right. And sometimes I think God and His great love just frustrates that a little bit because um, we really are bent on doing things that are within our wingspan, within my capacity. You know, I really think so often I miss out on what God has for me because I keep trying to measure it against what I know I can do mm. versus what He wants to do, maybe in me, for me, through me. Mm. And it's in those wilderness seasons. So this year, if you could read my journal, it's just a lot of me trying to scribe the devars in the midbar the word, mm. the words that he's giving me in this wilderness season. Because I 2020 feels like a wilderness yeah, for me. Yeah. Um, I am not a happy camper. A lot of times this year, I told a friend the other day, I feel like I'm living my life with my flag at half mass. Yeah. Um, and I'm, so I'm like, God, your timing is wrong. I don't know if you tell God he's wrong. But sometimes <laughs> I'm like, know? Lord, um, your timing you. <laughs> is wrong because my flag's at half mass. I'm not at full strength. I don't fully feel like myself. I'm disoriented. I'm insecure. I'm fearful. All this stuff is going on. And then all of these unprecedented opportunities are coming. And I'm like, Lord, no, just wait till I'm strong again. Yeah. Wait till my flag's at full. You know, wait. Right. No, no, no. You don't want me right now. <laughs> I'm a little shaky right now, yeah. you know? my road rage is kind of yeah. flaring up right now yeah. when I'm driving through town. But it is that word in the wilderness. It's yeah. that His word does not just live on mountaintops. Mm. 
He speaks in the valleys and he speaks in the low and he tabernacles with us. So to just know that in our lowest of lows, we are not alone. Mm -hmm. He is running. He is coming. He is tabernacling. He is dwelling Mm -hmm. with us. And just as he led the Israelites out of the desert, he's going to lead us out of our wilderness seasons. I'm going to go back to Israel, Lord willing, one day Mm -hmm. and you know, I'm going to know that joy again and that shalom, and I'm going to get to experience it with a team, but it's not for right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's just amazing how I feel like just the encouragement you've given us of who He is and how He meets us, that right there is for so many people that are watching right now that are feeling like, that was me. I was trying to find an emergency exit, and you're going, oh, no, hunker down. And the yeah. word, the Devar and the Midbar, yes. I love that. Just looking for the word in the wilderness of what he has for you right now. And maybe this is a tough time. Maybe it's just a tough day. Maybe it's been a tough two years, you know, for some people. But uh, just this reminder of who God is, that he is with us. He runs to us. Mm -hmm. And um, that right there is one of those things that regardless of what we're facing, knowing we're not alone, even if we feel like we are knowing, no, God is one that tabernacles with us. And so I love that. Chrissy, I could talk to you all day. And we do, actually. (laughs) We will go to sushi soon and we will continue this. Um, But for anybody watching that wants to connect with you and just see what all you're up to, social media, I'd love it if you'd let them know where they can find you. For sure. NewlandsBiblicalStudies.com. And I'm at Chrissy McClellan on Instagram. And I think I've got Twitter and some other things, but I don't know. Yeah, Instagram mainly. Yeah, there we go. What was the website for the studies? NewlandsBiblicalStudies.com. NewlandsBiblicals. And I'm going through her Jesus and women's study right now. And it's so, so good. Christy, you're amazing. Thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing hope and reminding us who God is. Thanks for being here. Thank you.